Hello, everybody. My name is Lisi. I'm a tester. And this is our story of mob programming, testing, and everything. It's an experience report seen through my own eyes. And I hope it will inspire you to try your own experiments in your own context. So what I want to talk about today is the following. Well, first of all, how it all began, right? How did we discover the mob approach for ourselves? How did we experiment with it? What did we learn there? Well, it had quite an impact on me personally, on our team, on our company, even our communities. Naturally, questions and doubts came up, so let's address those as well. And in the end, how can you experience it yourself? So let the story begin. I realized I love teamwork very early on. I love the fact that you can combine different expertise, different skills, knowledge, and something better gets out of it. You don't have to do everything on your own. You can share the load. It's great. So I always said I'm a strong team player. And I thrived in teams. Collaboration was good. All well. But well, what did collaboration really mean to me? Nowadays, I realize I was rather a strong individual contributor to a team. But when it came to doing my own tasks, I did them all by my own. I mean, I was hired to do them. I'm the expert here, right? I, I should do them best. Let me check you with you shortly. Who experienced this situation as a strong individual contributor? Please show your hands. Oh, a lot of you. OK, maybe you can feel me with the next one, too. <laughs> I was uncomfortable when someone else was like peeking over my shoulder and you know, wanted to see what I was doing. I felt stupid very quickly. I felt I lost all my ability like, to do simple things, like typing. Oh my gosh. I felt I could get judged as well. People would see my contribution wasn't that great after all, right? They would see my weaknesses. That was quite scary. So, if you're feeling comfortable enough, who of you feels me here? That's quite brave, so look around. We're not, we're not alone, that's good. So I was uncomfortable with doing things together. For example, I had a colleague who always sort of forced me into writing emails together, and I hated it back then. <laughs> Nowadays, I think a lot differently of that. But that's you know, where I started. But at the same time, I was preaching a whole team approach to testing and quality, just as propagated by Lisa Crispin, Janet Gregory, authors of one of the most influential books I've ever read, Agile Testing. The whole team should contribute, right? Well, in my head, it was asynchronously, obviously. Then I continued on my journey, and I learned about peer programming, peering in general, mostly in an extreme programming context. And people loved it. They already always shared how it can improve qu product quality and everything, and I was, I was actually fascinated. I thought, that's really cool. I would like to work in a team who pairs up regularly. I mean, the developers, right? Not me. So, well, I wasn't hurt by my team yet. And that was our situation back then. I've worked in a cross-functional team on one product, quite autonomous, self-contained, in lean structures. Nice. But when it comes to peering, people were not up for it. Some outright rejected this. I mean, of course, if someone needed support, sure, let's sit together, solve the problem. But please go back to your story then. That was the situation. Let me ask you again. Who of you here paired already with another person in any context? Maybe just once. Many. That's nice. Keep your hands up <laughs> if you work in a team that pairs up regularly. Some hands go down. Yeah. OK, thank you. And well, and then I learned about this unusual approach of mob programming. Having the whole team work together on the same Topic, same time, same place, on the same computer? 
wow, so unusual, it instantly intrigued me. And this time I realized I would be included then as well, right? But I wanted to learn more. I attended a conference talk about a similar approach. They called it swarming back then. I started following people on Twitter. I wanted to get more pieces of this puzzle and, and learn more about it. Let me check, you, check once more with this room. Who of you has been on a mob even just once, maybe, maybe at a meetup? Many really. Awesome. Keep your hands up if <laughs> you were mobbed at work with your own team full time. Yeah, you have some. Awesome. So my team never made it there, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> but first, here's my understanding of the mob approach. Mob programming was coined by Woody Sills' team back at Honda Industries in 2011. And according to them, it was all brilliant minds working on the same topic, same task, same place, same computer. They coined the term. Could well be people found similar approaches before, afterwards, but they made it public how they work, how they collaborate. And they simply wanted to find a better way how to work well together. And then turning up the good, what's working well, they frequently say, it's not carved in stone. Every team has to find their own ways in their own context. But let me now share a common variant. So the concept in a nutshell is that you have the driver at the keyboard, taking instructions, taking care of the implementations. You have a navigator leading the way, giving those instructions, thinking ahead, keeping the big picture in mind. Now, if we would stop here, we would have strong style pairing. And you can think of this driver-navigator relationship just like in a rally. The driver driving the track, really taking care we're not crashing. The navigator looking ahead, having the big map, looking out for the tricky spots. But we also have a mob, the rest of the team, observing, suggesting ideas, researching, taking notes, whatever helps, and also preparing for their own turn as driver and navigator because we're rotating frequently, either on timer on, or on task, whatever works. The designated navigator here, well, that's rather considered a training role, and it will dissolve in more mature mobs. But first, we have to learn how to navigate well. And this is a guideline that can help here. Try to always talk at the highest level of abstraction. Start with your intention first. Well, so let's take an example. Let's say we discovered quite some new test ideas, but we don't want to test them right away, but keep, the, keep note of them for later. So we could say, uh, let's note them down in a mind map. If the driver looks at you and says, like, OK, wh wh what do you mean? What should I do now? Maybe we need to provide a location. Oh, we have a mind mapping tool already installed. Uh, it's XMind. It's pinned in the dock. Well, maybe. Driver knows already. Perfect. But maybe not. It's like, what, what's the dock? What's XMind? So we might need to go down to details. So if that driver, for example, is coming from Windows, or it's like the taskbar just for macOS. So move the uh, mouse to the bottom of the screen. The dock will appear. There you see an X for the XMind icon. Just click on it. It will open up. Lots of details. Well, this amount of details, we only need to provide that once. People quickly pick up those details. So try to return to the highest level of abstraction as soon as possible. There are a few more things to note that can help when working in a mob. First of all, you're at the right place if you're either contributing or learning. If you have two ideas or more, and that can frequently happen when you have more people involved, well, try them both. And it's a good idea to try the ones of the more junior person in the room first. Or maybe the most unlikely idea, and it might surprise you. A rule from improvisational theater comes in handy as well. It's called yes and. 
try to build up on each other's ideas, not destroy them, especially when you rotate, you're becoming the next navigator, build up on, upon the idea. If you want to change directions, do it together as the whole mob. And there's one underlying principle here that I really like to make explicit. It's about treating each other with kindness, consideration, and respect. That's the underlying rule for everything. So overall, the whole mob approach is about finding out how to work well together. And it's not only about programming, even though the name might suggest that. You can also mob test, mob code review, mob anything. And it's working as a, in a peer is often called peering. Working in a mob is often called mobbing. Not hinting to the negative connotations this term might have. So in the course of this talk, let's think of the mob approach as such. But now let's see how this story evolves. So I guess I couldn't stop talking about the whole mob approach and this unusual idea and how I would like to try it out. And in the beginning of 2017, my team sat together, we brainstormed what we could experiment on for the next three months, we wanted to improve ourselves. And we thought, oh, maybe we try new development approaches, something that's out there already, we haven't tried it yet. Maybe that's something. And then suddenly one of my teammates suggested, oh, well, we could actually try that mob programming you're always talking about. I mean, we're pretty skeptic, but why not? I was quite surprised, but I jumped at that chance because I was really eager to. And remember my fears of showing my weaknesses and stuff? Well, they're still there. But still, it was too good not to do it, right? So we agreed on an experiment. We said, let's do five sessions. Short enough, always inspect and adapt, improve. Let's try it out and see what happens. And uh, often new teams start with a programming challenge, maybe, or any other learning challenge. But my team said, no, nah, that's not for us. We want to do it. If we do it, then we don't do it on a real story. Also something that includes everything back and front and everything, the team considered themselves as full stack, so they wanted to share that knowledge. Management learned about our experiment, and they cheered us. So lucky us working in an environment where we could experiment on these kind of things. But there were still doubts, but they were mostly coming from developer side. They raised the concern, how could this be productive? I mean, we're wasting our time here. I mean, we were going to try it out, yes, but just saying. We still would need, you know, testing, code review, everything. But despite all doubts, it happened. Our first mob session took place, and we had everything prepared. I had asked our Agile coach back then to help facilitate, because, I mean, I wanted to be on the mob. I wanted to be involved. So whole room prepared. We had an agenda. And we started with why. Why do we want to do this experiment again? And for us, the major reasons was to remove productivity blockers, to extend our toolbox. It's a learning opportunity, and we hope to get the best out of everybody. We explained the approach, just as I did now. We had information radiators all over the room, everything ready. And off we went. We had a retrospective in the end. And that was it. First mob session done. Well, this retrospective showed there were still a lot of doubts. People were not fully happy. But the positive things were more. So we decided, yep, let's continue. Let's do these other sessions. Now what happened in reality? We tried it by the book, as formal as you can have it. As I explained it, navigator leading the way, driver at the keyboard. We said there is, he's not allowed to think. The mob observing, suggesting ideas, rotating every four minutes. And when I read about the approach, other teams often stumbled across. Some people were not allowed or not given the chance to talk or talking over each other or maybe the team rejected people with um, more special roles. We didn't stumble there. 
but we still stumbled. For us, meeting rooms were a big, big problem. I don't know about your company, but for us, it's a scarce resource. Yeah, OK, I, I hear some. Uh-huh. Also, well, different operating systems, different keyboard language layouts, different scrolling directions, different custom shortcuts, different IDEs, everything. And yeah, that, that was considered a major, major blocker. <laughs> Storyscope also didn't feel right. Some said, no, it's, it's too small. Others said, no, it's too big. Maybe let's do it from start to land. No, just let's do mob on a part. Discussions here. Remote. In two sessions, two people worked from remote. We couldn't figure out yet how to let them drive as well. But overall, the whole team felt, you know, this, this approach, it felt too formal. They wanted to right away change things. And when I read about it, it was recommended, you know, just do it strictly. The first five times at least, just do it by the book. But I felt this team would have stopped instantly if we wouldn't have changed a few things. So that's what we did, and this way we learned our own way. Let's make it easy. Let's do it in our own office. No meeting rooms booking anymore. Solve that problem. We just put a big TV screen right in our office, put a table in front, everything prepared. We could just put our chairs, roll in front of them, start right away, as easy as possible. But we still had different computers, different setups and everything. Um, we stumbled there. Using another person's computer? Well, it's tricky. Using it in front of everyone else? It's even more trickier. But the good thing is we all stumbled, so it was quite safe, right? <laughs> because we changed computers as well. What, what did the trick here was that after like one rotation, and everybody stumbled once, we actually focused on the task at hand. So the setup wasn't that important anymore. And actually, by using different setups, we learned an, a lot new tools, approaches, and ways of solving things that we didn't know before. And we became a lot more flexible. We also adapted our rotations. At first, we said, OK, let's not do it every four minutes. Let's maybe do it every 15 or longer or even shorter again. And in the end, we decided, let's just switch naturally on task. One thing finished, rotate, next one. The driver not being allowed to think didn't feel good to us. So we said, no, everybody is welcome to contribute, including the driver. But they must not rush ahead. That's the critical part. They're allowed to suggest their ideas to the navigator, the mob. Fine, just not rush ahead. This designated navigator dissolved, just as expected. As soon as we learned how to navigate as a team, wasn't needed anymore. And very important for us, we allowed partial mobs. Having everyone together wouldn't have worked out so well anyway, because people had very, very different times where they needed to go to important meetings, work on some personal stuff. It wouldn't have worked out. We noticed, as soon as we allowed partial mobs, people started to try to come back as soon as possible. They felt maybe they would miss out on something fun there. But, well, that's how it was. We did our five sessions, worked well, and we decided, yep, that's a good tool. Let's put it in our toolbox. And it lived quite happily there. And from time to time, we would pull it out and mop on another story, but that's it. Until the following happened. Back in 2017, we had one person in the team who took care of all things infrastructure, build pipeline, database, everything. And he loved that work, so he did it for two other teams as well. Well, not surprisingly, we built up a huge knowledge silo. He was the only one being able to do that, knowing how everything should, was supposed to work even. It was quite embarrassing. We didn't even know how to start a production database. And, well, when that person was on sick leave or vacation, we postponed stuff. Hopefully, he's coming back soon. But besides that, it was quite convenient, right? Our lottery factor back then wasn't great. You know, what happens when 
one team member wins the lottery, quits today, does the show go on? Well, basically, that's what happened to us. <laughs> he didn't win the lottery, but still, he quit his job. And we even had a three-month period of knowledge transfer. It's a handover. And actually, they ha happened as well. But it's the curse of implicit knowledge. You don't know what the others don't know. So that team member was gone. And we faced a big new epic. We had to move our whole infrastructure from a private data center to AWS and Kubernetes. So we had a problem. We didn't know how things were supposed to work. And there was new technology involved. So what to do? Well, we just have put this new tool in our toolbox, right? Maybe it will come in handy right now. As Alan here also says, a mob can really help dissolve knowledge silos. And that's what we tried. We said, OK, let's have all brains in. Let's do it together and instantly also spread this knowledge so everybody has a base and we avoid this bottleneck situation in the future. And that was the most intense time my team back then and I mobbed together. We had to learn a lot of things because nobody knew how. Sometimes we did that asynchronously before and then moved together in a mob. Sometimes we just sat together, researched asynchronously, but could still ask everybody in just in time. But most often, actually, we just learned together in the mob. And we managed to do it. So awesome. All infrastructure moved, most things automated, so we would still know how things are going. And success. We still mobbed from time to time, two, three months, uh, two, two, three times per month, around about that. Um, sometimes marking a story in advance, but way more often actually it happened that when working on something, someone called out, here, we need a mob on that one. S solving tricky problems with that and sharing knowledge. That's what we found most valuable back then. And sometimes, well, we started to use it for everything. Besides developing, testing, deploying, automating stuff, we also mobbed on documentation, creating stakeholder presentations, and we all could, can, could give them. Wri writing delicate emails, <laughs> customer support, debugging things, you name it. We found this to be the true realization of the whole team approach. And it left quite an impact on me personally, our team, company, our communities. Let's start with me here. Working on a mob, well, that helped me to learn a lot. And just as an example, one thing it really, really helped me with is was to become more confident with code. I'm not coming from a programming background, so my whole career, I just picked up things on my journey and bits and pieces of knowledge here and there, I'm trying to puzzle things together. But suddenly, I was at the keyboard as well, right? Having to write a function in a language I wasn't familiar with. That was scary. I was nervous as hell. But it worked very well. And understanding came over time. But I could also contribute right from the start, and a lot more than I thought in the beginning, than what I feared. I asked those questions nobody dared to ask right in time, while we were still in the context. I shared my testing knowledge. Where could we get the test data from? What kind of heuristics could we apply here? What to look for? I could raise risks whenever I saw them, also just in time. I got us to test in very, very small steps, right from the beginning. And I contributed with my holistic product knowledge, historical knowledge, the vision, so overall, I learned that people with different perspectives can bring a lot to the table. So if you mob, invite them in. Looking back, actually, I also grew a lot more senior on a mob. 
when it comes to the following aspects. How to listen. How to communicate well. How to really collaborate in a synchronous way. Empathy, so often underrated and so essential. Improving my observation skills, allowing me to raise those risks a lot earlier. What does it mean to make space for others without speaking for them? Helping others grow. I became a lot be better teacher on a mob. I was quite guilty of, you know, of doing the following. <laughs> oh, you didn't know that? Oh, that's so easy. How can't you know, not know that? Even I know that. I mean, that's, right? Stupid. Well, maybe not the best idea to teach. So maybe we can rephrase that. Oh, that's great. That's a learning opportunity here. Let me show you how. Well, and overall, I learned there are a lot more ways than my own. And mine might not always be the best. The impact on our team. Well, remember, my team was really, really hesitant to pair up. The side effect of mobbing was we suddenly paired up. Oftentimes, I hear the mob to be like the next evolutionary step after pairing. For us, it was the other way around. We first needed to experience the benefits of the mob and the safe environment to allow ourselves to pair up. So, we paired up a lot more in different constellations. We didn't shy away from that. Sometimes we paired from start to end. Sometimes other people would join in. We would form small mobs quite naturally. Other people left again quite naturally. Another effect the mob had was that we became a lot closer in the team. We were a bunch of different characters, having different needs. The mob helped us to become close. We made it fun. It was fun working to together. And we didn't force people to be on the mob, right? Usually, I had this socializing, bonding time with my previous teams during lunchtime, just eating together. But with this team, we all had different lunch habits. Didn't work out. We never ate together. So one of my teammates back then suggested, but we all do coffee. What about having coffee breaks together? So we synchronized our bigger breaks, and that had just the effect. We suddenly could use the time for socializing, bonding. And also as a side effect, well, from time to time, we needed to get up, walk over to the coffee machine, different setting, coming back refreshed, and creativity flew again, just by getting up and walking. So overall, changing our collaboration dynamics triggered a culture change for my team. But it didn't stop there. Looking at our organization, more teams learned that we experimented with a mob approach, and they asked for introduction sessions. Well, I did them. And I also discovered this way, it could be a great tool to learn from each other across team boundaries. What if we experiment with a series of cross-team, cross-role, cross-location mobs? And it worked out. Now we figured out how to work also remotely in a mob. And people who volunteer for such a learning experiment, well, they might just be the allies you need in the teams. I introduced the approach also to our internal testing community, mob testing. End of last year, we started a series of security testing mobs, practicing our skills there, spreading knowledge. Works fine. I discovered this approach to be a great tool also for giving workshops. So I often did exploratory testing workshops for developers in the mob format. And by the way, I'm also doing that workshop tomorrow in case you signed up for it, or if you're lucky enough to get in. I will welcome you. Other teams found, let's try different, different ways. One team had a bigger release coming up, and they were not quite sure, did we really uncover all the risks that are there? So they invited in their stakeholders, other people who were interested to join, and they all mobbed together. 
And since end of last year, we now even have a very first team in our company who experiments with mobbing full time. I'm super excited to hear about their lessons learned. And if you are too, you're in luck because Thomas Ploch, who's also a speaker at this very conference, is a member of that, ex that very team. So I'm sure he'd be glad to share his experiences. But the impact doesn't stop with our company. It's also visible outside in the communities we're in. I personally learn a lot when I join other mob sessions at conferences. I learn how to become a better mob facilitator, how to become a better mob member. And I started to give sessions at conferences myself, official ones, introduction sessions, learn how to learn in a mob, on exploiter testing, whatnot. Sometimes informally during open space. I can always suggest a session there. Or at local meetups. Or remotely with a learning group I'm part of. But one of the most important things that I learned when mobbing a lot and also peering a lot is that I can learn from everyone. No matter their seniority level, their role, their background, their kind of expertise or any other, any other aspect. And actually, the more diverse we are, the greater the learning opportunity. And I can also contribute by sharing my knowledge and also learning by sharing. So I really strongly believe that when we all learn from each other, our growth will increase exponentially. And the outcome of working well together will be a lot better than this, you know, old-fashioned asynchronous approach. That's all very well. But I assume you might have questions, you might have doubts. We definitely had. At times, th things went really, really well. But at other times, we got questioned. I got questioned. But you're a tester. Why do you join the mob? Can you even contribute? I mean, there's nothing to test yet, right? Our product owner challenged me once. Do you really provide value on a mob? He, actually, he meant it well. <laughs> he simply wanted to see I use my time to the best I can. But interestingly, I didn't even have to respond. My team stepped up immediately and said, because you know they saw the benefit, they defended me. They especially like me to have, have me right in the moment and, you know, avoiding that whole back and forth ping pong of asynchronous work. So specialist roles really should not worry of slowing people down. And admittedly, I, so I did sometimes slow down the mob. But it allows us to think things through, think more thoughtfully. And it forced people to really understand what they're trying to explain. A bit slower allowed us to go in the right direction a lot faster. Now, sometimes we also got questioned as a whole team. You know, is it really worth to mob on this story? Can we be, you know, do that more productively? Can we parallelize? This was mostly coming also from product side, but often also from developer side. Sometimes from, you know, our own teammates. New people joined the team. The team changed, and they were pretty skeptic as well, what we're doing there. Also now, they rather prefer to work in a solo fashion. And that's OK, too. We don't force anybody to stay or be on the mob. We try to use the approach that we deem best. But let's not dive a bit deeper into this whole productivity concern. That's frequently coming up. Whenever I talk about the mob approach, that's the one that's coming up. How productive can it be to have all the people working on the same topic? Now, I listened to Woody Swill. He did a keynote at Mob Programming Conference 2018 on the power of flow. And he flips this question around. He says, how productive can it be to have all people working in silos? Who has ever proven that working in silos is more productive? That resonated with me. And back then, actually, his team even measured their outcome. 
what they could deliver. And they found they could deliver more stuff, better stuff, better done, better quality. Now, in my team, we actually never did measure things quantitatively, but the qualitative feedback that we got spoke volumes. Woody says, let's rather focus on effectiveness. But what does he mean that by that? So according to Woody, and that again resonated really well with me, and that's why I'm going to present it to you as well, is that efficiency, well, it's doing things right in a really efficient way. But it could result in busy work. Might be, we might be working on the wrong things after all. And productivity, well, the output you get for the input, getting things done. Well, we still might work on the wrong things. And effectiveness, it's getting the right things done. And he's he was quoting his father. I'd rather work slowly on the right thing than quickly on the wrong thing. Now again, how can we be effective with five people working on one topic? If we flip that one over, how can we be effective if we separate people who should be working together? Let's leave it there. And now focus on peering. So one step back. I see a lot of benefits when it comes to peering. It's very useful for getting things done, right? You stay focused, you stay disciplined, you have the other one. You get everything done needed. It's also great to combine your skills and knowledge. Have both persons benefit from that especially when you appear in different constellations, well, knowledge will spread across the team. It will teach you both what the other one is doing. It's, like it's a bi-directional way of learning. Implicit knowledge becomes explicit when you create a shared context here together. Pairing really helps to generate more ideas faster. It's extremely valuable when doing exploratory testing or debugging a problem. You can nicely complement each other and you hardly get stuck this way. It also makes you think. By peering, we include different thoughts and viewpoints. And diversity challenges our own understanding. And this way we have a chance to create a shared one. A word of warning here. I think peering is great for learning, but for that, it has to feel safe. It's not there to enforce any power dynamics that might exist already. It's rather there to diffuse them. So more senior people can really help more junior ones grow. And at the same time, learn from them as well. If you share your vulnerabilities and fears in the beginning of a session, it allows the other person to do the same. So I often think of pairing as, you know, the one skill that you should really learn in your career. Unless uh, you have the chance to discover the mob, of course. So how does it all relate? Now, in my experience, all the points of pairing also apply in a mob, and they're even multiplied. In a mob, you have all brains in. You probably won't get the most out of everybody. But you will get the best out of everybody and quality outcome is what we're looking for. The whole team has only one topic in, in progress, so no context switches. You don't have to stop what you're currently doing to review a merge request. Awesome. Might be slower. Well, for now, yes. But we can go faster in the right direction. Also, this question queue time is reduced. You know, the time you wait for an answer to a question that's really blocking you, even better, you're quickly able to discover those questions earlier. So you nearly never block this way. Bottlenecks, most bottlenecks are gone. And the whole back and forth ping pong is gone as well. We often tend to forget how often things tend to come back to us. Everybody is instantly informed about every, everything. Decisions are made together. There's no need for follow-up tasks or daily syncs. You're synchronized all the time. Knowledge is spread across the whole team, also implicit knowledge. So when you mob regularly, vacation replacement, 
no problem anymore. And it's also great for onboarding. We actually had that in our very, very first mob session. It was the third day of a new team member. That was great. The mob will quickly show the new person how things are done around here. You get immediate answers to your questions, immediate support. I feel it's safer than peering as well. Power dynamics are mitigated a lot better by the whole team. And it's also less intense than peering. You can easily opt out, take a break for yourself. The mob won't stop. If you do that in a peer, you instantly stop the peer. Therefore, I think mobbing is a lot more introvert friendly, and I'm speaking as a very deep introvert. I need my breaks. I need to recharge my batteries. In a mob, I can also sometimes just lean back or take a break. I won't stop the work. I can quickly get up to date again. In a mob, we can grow everyone. More senior people can help others learn by learning themselves how to express their intention properly, how to communicate well. More junior ones can practice hands-on. Perfect. And becoming close is also a nice benefit, as it happened with my team as well. Well, lots of benefits, right? But let's have a look at it from another angle and also continue telling the story because there's more to it. My team changed again. So new people came, other people left. We're not the same team again. We mopped less and less with the whole team, sometimes small ones. The new joiners, not all of them were willing to join the mob. Some just simply preferred to work alone. They didn't discover those benefits for themselves yet. Those who were rather up for it, well, they rather prepared. My own role changed as well. I was expected to spend a lot more time aside from my team, with other teams, working globally. So when my team paired, mobbed, I often was not there. In this way, I learned about further re reasons why to mob. So here's my perception of what happened. Information sharing across the whole team decreased. Parts of the team, well, the information never arrived there, like with me. People said, but you know, we talked about it already, right? Probably, probably they did. I wasn't there. Or this wasn't interesting for you. Maybe, maybe not. I realized I learned less, a lot less, especially when new technology was introduced again. I needed to catch up on my own, and I'm sure I missed a lot. As a dedicated tester in the team, my role is a bit special. I'm there to bring in the knowledge, the perspective, the focus. And not having been on the mob, I came to the picture a lot later. I often had no idea what had been discussed already, which decisions had been made. And people often did just not, did not remember what was important to share. I got a lot, lot less chance to share my own knowledge and spread it across the team. So knowledge silos evolved again, new bottlenecks. And there's also a social factor to it. I felt a lot more separate again. We suddenly handed over things again, and I felt we are falling back to old habits. We had to play ping pong again, so there was a lot more rework to be done before we could actually deliver value to our users. And overall, well, this was definitely less fun. Last but not least, let's answer another frequent question that came up. When to mob, when not to, when to stop? Now, different companies have different answers here. Back at Hunter Industries, they still mob full time. In my team, it's rather a tool in a toolbox, and we pull it out when we need it, on demand. But when not to mob? What's not a good candidate to mob on? Well, confidential tasks, things that you can't share across the whole team by nature, not a good candidate. 
Administrative work, well, might not be such a good candidate at all. But that being said, we also did travel expense reports together in a more effective way, because they're not so easy sometimes, or scheduling meetings. So, but overall, overly simplistic tasks, they might not be the best candidate. But again, who am I to judge what's simple for you? Besides that, anything else is valid to be experimented with in your context. For us, we found complicated tasks, complex tasks, those were the best for us. Now, when to stop, I suggest to look for an energy drop in the mob. People losing focus, drifting away. There could be a lot of reasons why, but maybe, you know, let's take a break, figure it out why, and then decide. Maybe it was just the break that was needed, maybe we switch modes. Now, in the end, I can talk a lot about the mob approach, right? But it's way better to experience it yourself. So do you now keep wondering how this could work out? How would you interact? What would change? Well, the only way to know and to find out is to give it a try. Nobody can tell it won't work until you haven't given it a real try. Experience it, see the results, judge for yourself. Take this home, try it with your own team. Maybe an internal community, maybe at a local meetup, whatever works. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, as shared in the beginning. Also this approach, it's not carved in stone. It's just, just sharing what worked for us. So you have to experiment and find out what works for you in your context. And for that, People have to be ready, and sometimes not all people are ready to experiment. Find that sweet spot where they are willing to move a bit. And with every step, they probably open up a bit more and a bit more. Change takes time. But if you have the chance to do a first mob, well, then here's what worked for us. Maybe it will help you too. It really helped us to prepare the whole setup have a quiet space, a big screen or projection that everybody can see comfortably, having good chairs so everybody can sit comfortably, uh, have an external keyboard, external mouse, be ready to switch keyboard languages. Drinks, food, snacks, you know, can help too. Start with why. Remind them, why are we trying to experiment here? What's the, what's the outcome that we expect to happen? Explain the mob. I really love to keep that as short as possible, as lightweight as possible. So usually I just do a flip chart visualization as I showed you. Get them to doing as soon as possible. Pieces will fall into their place. A designated navigator and facilitator can really help in the beginning. Pick a small task, nothing too complex. They first need to learn how to work well together and choose the task according to the group. It could be a coding carter, it could be exploratory testing, it could be a real story, just in our case. Mob for an hour, two hours, not too much, quite intense in the beginning, but definitely end happy. And to close the session, don't forget about the retrospective. Reflecting helps immensely, so just do a short one. What worked well? Where do we stumble? What to improve for the next session? The one action item to change. Just with any other change, inspect and adapt, try to continuously improve. It's important to make it a safe learning environment and to call that out. Call out a safe space. Remember, kindness, consideration and respect. Make space for others. Have all voices heard. Be aware of that. People have different needs. So talk about them. Put them on the table. Agree how you want to try this out. Make things explicit. It really, really helps. Because after all, it's all about the people. How we work well together. 
how we solve problems together and improve together, how we deliver value and enjoy working together, how can we do something meaningful together. On our journey, I found a lot of valuable resources that helped us on our way, and you can find them here on this page. Now, our story of mob programming, testing, and everything is not over yet. I'm sure the best is yet to come. But still, I already learned so many benefits of this approach that I really strongly recommend you. Try it out. Gain your own experience. And then turn up the good. In case you have questions, I'm still around at the conference, or you can also write me a direct message on Twitter, they're open. I'd really love to hear your stories, hear from your experiments, your experiences that you gain on a mob. Thank you. <laughs>